Good morning and welcome to online worship with Metropolitan Community Church of Portland. If you have a candle with you, I'd ask that you light your candle as I light mine and we begin our time of worship together by sharing prayer. God, we're grateful for this opportunity to gather our spirits and our intentions to unite together, even if we are apart from one another in body, that your spirit binds our spirits together. God, we pray in this moment and in this time that we open ourselves to be fully present to you as your spirit is fully present to us right now. God, we pray that you bless our worship in your holy name, and in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning again, and welcome to Online Worship with MCC Portland. I'm Reverend Nathan Meckley, pronouns he, him, his, and I have the honor of being the pastor of MCC Portland, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our worship, whether you've been with us a hundred times or this is your very first time with us. We are delighted that you're sharing this worship experience with us. A few things to let you know in advance. As you were preparing to sign on, you had the opportunity to complete our online connection card. I'd encourage you to do that. The link is found in the comment section. You can do that at any time. Also, you had the opportunity to make your offering online. The link for that online offering is also found in the comment section. And please, we encourage you to use the comment section. We can't always see who's worshiping with us online, so say hello at least in the comment section so we can greet you personally and engage with you throughout worship. Post comments, respond to the songs we sing, the prayers that we pray. Let us know what's touching your heart and spirit today. Also, if you're planning to worship with us online again in the future, have a candle at the ready so that you can light your candle where you are as we begin our worship and prayer. And every Sunday we celebrate communion at MCC. So have bread and cup available so that wherever you are, you can share in that sacred meal as we all do when we share worship, uh, when we share communion later in our worship today. Last but not least, if you find this online worship experience with us to be a blessing to your heart and spirit, please like and share this video with others whom you believe will be blessed and will be strengthened by the connection with MCC Portland. Again, I'm delighted that you're sharing worship with us today. Let's continue in that spirit of worship as we sing. MCC, sing with me. Great is thy faithfulness, God, my creator. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Blessings all mine with ten thousand. 
continuing our emphasis on local history, this Women's History Month, we recognize that women's history is local history. We begin with the story of Tabitha Moffat Brown. Tabitha Moffat Brown was an early pioneer on the treacherous journey of the Oregon Trail. She settled with her family in Oregon Territory, where she was a founder of Tualatin Academy and eventually Pacific University. Born in Massachusetts, Tabitha married Reverend Clark Brown and they had four children. After her husband's death in 1817, Tabitha taught school to support her family and later relocated her family to Missouri so her children could be closer to other family members where she continued as a school teacher. In 1853, Tabitha's son, Oris, traveled to the Oregon Territory and became part of a settlement near the present town of Forest Grove. Pleased with the prospects, he returned to Missouri to persuade his family to go west with him, including his mother, Tabitha, aged 66, and his uncle, aged 77. On Wednesday, April 15, 1846, three generations of the Brown family began the long and arduous journey in five wagons. While in Idaho, they were informed of a so-called shortcut. However, after the wagon train embarked on the new route, their guide disappeared and they were left on their own. An excerpt from Tabitha's journal reads, I rode through the Umpqua Mountains in three days at the risk of my life on horseback, having lost my wagon and all that I had but the horse I was on. Despite great hardships and losses and being near starvation, Tabitha pulled through with her family arriving in the settlement south of Salem on Christmas Day. About a year after arriving, Brown visited her son in the West Tualatin area where she met Reverend Harvey Clark and his wife Eveline, and seeing the plight of local orphans who had lost parents on the journey west, Brown's heart was touched. The Clarks donated a piece of planned land upon which they established an orphanage. With the help of neighbors, Brown gathered supplies and began to provide these children with loving care. During the first year, Brown also had 30 wards left with her while their parents traveled south to participate in the California Gold Rush. The initial orphanage grew to include a school and evolved into the Tualatin Academy, a secondary school to educate local children. They received permission to hold classes in a local meeting house in Forest Grove. The Academy received its charter from the Territorial Government of Oregon on September 26, 1849, the first such charter granted. The Academy was devoted to educate younger children, so leaders proposed a collegiate department to train teachers. On January 10, 1854, the original charter was changed to create Tualatin Academy and Pacific University, Pacific University awarding its first degree in 1863 also the first in the region. Tabitha Moffat Brown died on May 4, 1858, while living with her daughter in Salem, Oregon. In the Oregon State Capitol, 158 names are inscribed in the legislative chambers. Only six are women. One of those is Tabitha Moffat Brown. She was honored in 1987 by the Oregon legislature with the title, The Mother of Oregon. Today's reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are recalled, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength.
Have you ever had the experience of God doing something in an unexpected way? Can I get an amen? Perhaps it was a joyful, maybe it was a painful experience or awareness with or through someone or something unpredictable and unplanned. I dare say when I pause and reflect upon that question myself, it has happened, frankly, more often than not. And the lesson that I keep learning over and over again is that as thoughtful as I try to be, as intelligent as I occasionally think I might be, much to my consternation, God simply has other ways of doing things. God simply prefers to do things her way rather than mine. When I read through this passage of scripture, from the first letter of Paul to the church in Corinth, I was reminded of that amazing and frankly confounding and sometimes upsetting characteristic of God. And even more so, which is Paul's obvious point in this passage, when it comes to one of the most central, indeed ubiquitous, aspects of Christian history and theology, the cross itself, that confounding and unexpected quality is front and center. Crosses are the most widely and best known symbols of Christianity. They're so familiar in the skylines of towns and cities across our country. They are jewelry that many of us wear, body art that may be tattooed into our skin. They become so familiar and so visible. Even though the story of the crucifixion has always been central to the story of Jesus and the proclamation of the good news of the gospel, for many the cross is now barely even a religious symbol, perhaps emptied of much of its meaning. In the writings of Paul, and in all of the gospels, and even in a few non-biblical references that we have, that Jesus was crucified is the least disputed claim about the events of Jesus' life, and as one of the most horrific forms of execution ever derived in history, it is how the one whom Christians then and now claim to follow was killed. And given the central importance of the cross, it's curious that the earliest symbols of Christianity and the followers of Jesus were not crosses. They were usually fish, sometimes accompanied by the Greek letters, which were also used for Christ. And the earliest discovered symbol of a cross that is directly related to Christians is the second century in Rome, and it's actually anti-Christian graffiti. And it wasn't for another 200 years in the 4th century, some 300 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, after crucifixion had ceased to be a form of execution in the Roman Empire, that the symbol of the cross rises to become the dominant Christian symbol. Perhaps it was only possible when witnessing crucifixions were a more and more distant memory. And it seems also a great irony that the rise of the cross as a symbol in the fourth century was also when Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. And for all of the remaining centuries up until our day, what had first been seen as a difficult but transformative death became the symbol under which even greater harms were committed. Crusades, colonization, horrors done under the banner of the cross that continue to our own day. Which people are going to be victimized? Which nations, which persons scapegoated, bullied to death? The cross 
is one of the most uncomfortable aspects of Christianity many of us may prefer to avoid, but with which we must contend, because there is no Christianity without the story of Jesus, can't be a follower of Jesus without a Jesus, and there is no story of Jesus without including the story of his death on a cross, which we thankfully know is not the end of the story, praise God. Yet it is a pivotally important chapter which cannot be avoided. So this passage from 1 Corinthians is in fact one of the scheduled readings in the cycle of the lectionary this week. So it's a topic that we have another opportunity with which to contend. And let me tell you, if it makes you uncomfortable and you prefer to tune out, if it's painful, if it's embarrassing, guess what? It has always been. Perhaps that's why 15 years of church history has tried to sanitize it. Is it meaningful at all any longer? Paul memorably writes here, the message of the cross is, quote, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Stumbling block for the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles. In short, in Paul's worldview, there are Jews and Gentiles. So in short, what Paul is saying, it doesn't make sense to anyone. It doesn't make sense to anybody. That is why it's foolishness. That is why it's a stumbling block. It was the lowliest and most humiliating death possible, a public execution as a criminal used on public display to instill fear and to intimidate others, a stumbling block for the Jews. So many thousands of them had already been crucified in failed attempts to repel the Romans, and the anticipated Messiah could be many, many things, but was not to die in such a manner. Crucifixion was considered a curse not a blessing. Greeks and other Gentiles, no deity could really be killed, but even if so, would never be killed in such a gruesome and humiliating fashion, unseemly, unfitting for a deity, and any god that would use this as a way to reveal power was inconceivable. How could, why would, God ever use such a means to reveal anything that could be called good news. To grasp the meaning and the rationale, perhaps, of the cross of crucifixion, I believe we need to desanitize it again, if there is such a word, I just made it up, to desanitize it again and begin to see it for what it was. Crucifixion was perhaps the most barbaric form of execution ever devised, a public death that was meant as a warning to others to instill fear and terror and submission to the empire and the powers that be, the ruling powers. That's why I think the equivalencies that are sometimes made in our modern day to our modern forms of capital punishment, which crucifixion was capital punishment, our modern forms of capital punishment, barbaric as they are and as ended as they must be, are not quite the equivalent because mostly they are done in hidden places with very few people as witnesses. And I think our closest modern equivalent that we can perhaps draw is that uniquely American horror of lynching. Public death on display meant to terrorize others. A roughly equivalent sign of intimidation. A rope noose as a visible threat of violence and death. Perhaps if we visualize that, we can begin to feel some sense of the dreadful weight of the symbol. 
A couple of weeks ago, we heard a short excerpt from that nighttime conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus in the third chapter of the Gospel according to John. And one of the things that Jesus says in that conversation, which wasn't part of the excerpt that we used, one of the things that Jesus says in that conversation is a foreshadowing of his death, his death on the cross. He mentions that the chosen one, the Messiah, must be lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. In that, referring to that even more ancient story during the exodus from slavery in Egypt, how the children of Israel were wandering in the desert, and in a particular episode, they were dying from being bitten by serpents. And Moses is instructed to put a bronze serpent on a tall staff that was visible, and anyone who was bitten by one of the serpents was to look at that bronze serpent on the staff, and they would live. Essentially, in that parallel, drawing that parallel, the story of the bronze serpent and therefore the cross, both teach a similarly important truth. And the truth, as I see it, is this only by looking at what's ailing us, only at looking, only by looking at what's ailing us, can we be healed. Only by looking squarely at what is killing us, can we be saved. Only by looking at what is killing us, can we possibly be saved. Now, I don't know about you, I, I don't often want to look at what is painful. I don't want to look at what is most painful in myself, in ourselves perhaps, in the world. Often, I, you, we may prefer to avoid it or gloss over it. But you and I know that only works for a little while until it becomes intolerable and cannot be ignored. But the good news, and as I see it, the good news of the cross is that God offers us this other way. God's other way. God enters into, identifies with, doesn't rise above, but takes on the pain and the hardship and the struggle, unites with our humanity in it. When we ask, where are you, God, during a painful moment, God's answer is the cross. Where am I? I am on the cross. Where am I? I am on the gallows. Where am I? I have my face on the pavement with a knee on my neck, gasping for breath. God answers with the cross. God's other way. Many years ago, probably 15 years or so, or perhaps more, longer, I got a Christmas gift from my mother. Now, as a pastor, I have lots of crosses. Um, they are, many of them are beautiful, many of them are rustic, um, and I treasure them all differently. But the one I received as a gift from my mother, I do treasure uniquely. I'm wearing it right now, so I'm going to take it off and hold it up to the camera so you can see it a little better. I've shared this uh, once before at church, I believe. But this cross is made from, as you can see, a bullet casing. It initially uh, was not on a cord, but I added that so that I was able to wear it and not just carry it. I don't know the full story of this. I do know that um, it came from craftspersons in Liberia, Africa. And I put it on a cord and I now wear it most frequently when I am participating in uh, public witness and protest because many if not most of those that we experience are responses to violence 
that we experience. And this little slip of paper came with this cross. And it has the quote of scripture from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One of the promises of the ancient prophet. And it says, by creating these crosses, craftspeople in Liberia transform instruments of death, spent shell casings, into symbols of peace and hope. While serving as a reminder of the brutal ugliness of war and crucifixion, the crosses also provide a reminder of God's redeeming, transforming act in Jesus Christ. With the rise in gun violence in our country, with the rise in gun violence in our very own city of Portland over these recent weeks, we could pick up such a bullet casing in nearly any neighborhood, in nearly any city, including our own. What would it take to transform such a sign of death into the promise of new life. Nothing that we could imagine, nothing that we could expect or plan or conceive. It takes God's other way. What would it take to transform a sign of death into a promise of new life? That is the foolishness. That is the wisdom of the cross. There's a caution that comes with, that came with this cross. This caution, some crosses may have rough edges. Please handle with care. Some crosses may have rough edges. Please handle with care. Perhaps that is a reminder that should be on all crosses. If there are no rough edges, perhaps it is not the, cro the cross of Jesus Christ. And if there is no reminder of the promise of new life, Perhaps it is not the cross of Jesus Christ. It can only be the cross of Jesus Christ with rough edges. It can only be the cross of Jesus Christ if it carries with it the promise of God's solidarity with the suffering and the promise of new and resurrected life. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning him back. No turning back. We are now at the time for prayer. We at MCC are foolish enough to believe that healing comes from God, that Jesus is God's gift. His sacrifice gives life to all who believe and receive God. 
We trust God to direct us through life's troubles. Anyone in need of prayer can contact us right here with the connection card. We welcome your prayers and praise reports to our email, admin at mccportland.com. Or you can call the CLT phone number, which you can find in the contact section here. If you need immediate prayer, you may call our CLT phone. It is a safe and confidential line dedicated just for your prayers or for any need that comes up and is urgent to you. Please call us. If you get the recording, just leave your phone number and someone will get back to you soon. Now let us pray. Praise God for the foolishness of the gospel that makes it possible for people of all nations and faiths and abilities to know Christ and to be saved. I ask that Christ's message of love and peace be at the center of the meeting between the Pope and the leaders of the Islamic and Jewish religions, the first of its kind. May there be inclusion and justice. May the significance, if any there be, if there be any, enter the hearts and minds of your people. May your will be done as we near the hour of your return. Lord, I ask that your spirit guard the hearts and minds of your children and each and every one who comes into our minds as we pray, because we love those who are dear to us. We desire they be saved and come to know you. Destroy the foolish wisdom of the false Christs and misleading prophets like QAnon and so many cults that devour your children because your church has failed to love them. Dear Jesus, help us to be your message of love to those in need. Make us your hands and feet. Show us your way. Help us to follow. I'm praying for the homeless and who are on the streets of our cities for an end to gun violence in our towns. For those who have homes, but still have no electricity or water service because of the wildfires last summer or the recent freezing weather that caused widespread power outages. For our brothers, Paul and Wei, who have extensive water damage in their home due to frozen pipes. First, for one who has chronic pain due to a spinal disease. For others who are going through mental weakness due to aging. Lord, we have concerns over people not taking seriously the need to wear masks to slow the spread of the disease. For the states that are removing COVID-19 protocols too soon, please keep your children healthy, Lord. I'm praying for healing for David Blanchard. His faith is strong. For healing and comfort for our family members who are living alone for those in specialized care homes and hospice patients, God's mercy and grace, for peace where there is war, jobs for the unemployed. We pray for an end to the persecution and violence against our transgender children, for understanding and acceptance. God protect them and keep them safe. We bring these and other unspoken prayers and we lay them at your feet. Humbly we ask for you to answer our prayers. In the name of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. If none go with me, still I will follow. If none go with me, No turning back, no turning back. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. My cross I carry till I see Jesus. No turning back.
Let me take a moment and share a few announcements about things that are happening in the life of MCC Portland. We do deliver an e-newsletter directly to your email address if we have that, and we also post it here on our Facebook page so you can check back anytime and find out more information about activities in the life of MCC Portland. Again, we encourage you to complete the online connection card. That's a perfect way to give us your contact information so we can stay in touch. And also, it's a great way to share your prayers with us, your prayers of joy and thanksgiving, your burdens of concern, and we share those with our prayer team who pray with and for us regularly. If you're needing a little bit of extra support at this time, and we all do at some time or another, don't we? please be in touch with our Congregational Life team directly. Their contact information is found on the screen. We can, we're here to offer you caring conversation. We can provide referrals for you to resources that may be beyond what we're able to provide as a congregation. And also, we can pray with you and include you in our prayers. So be in touch with our Congregational Life team. We're ready, willing, and able to give you that little bit of extra support that you may need. Also, if you want to connect with others at MCC a little bit more, on Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., we have our midweek prayer, a time of informal prayer. We have that online via Zoom and also on site simultaneously. You can join us either way to share that time of prayer at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. And on Thursday at 6.30 p.m., we have our ongoing discussion group during this season of Lent. It's Excavate, Examine, and Engage. We're looking at some very particular ways that systems and structures in our world and in our society lead to a brokenness that we are called to heal. So you're welcome to join us. That's online Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. We had a session where we were talking about local governance. We had just this last week a session where we had a presentation on urban planning, on how it impacts inclusion and exclusion. It's a wonderful time to both learn and also to reflect theologically about how we are called to change and what actions we might be able to take as people of faith to help heal our society and our world. Thursday at 6.30 p.m. And coming up in only a couple weeks, I'm really excited to remind you we have another drive-in social on Saturday, March 20th, beginning at 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. A beautiful day in the neighborhood is what we're calling it because March 20th turns out to be Mr. Rogers' birthday. We're going to gather at 2820 at Southeast Stevens Street in the parking lot. We're going to share some cupcakes. We're going to have wonderful music from the song, singer-songwriter Bobby Joe Valentine. And if you've ever experienced or heard him sing, it's a wonderful treat not to be missed. So I really encourage you to join us on the 20th. I do ask, and we do ask to make sure, not only to make sure we have enough cupcakes for everyone, but also to assure that we don't exceed safe capacity for gathering. Please RSVP, let us know that you are coming and let us know by March 17th. That allows us enough time to prepare for the 20th. And just as added fun, because it falls on Mr. Rogers' birthday, we're encouraging you to wear a cardigan sweater or, and, or, it's not an either or, bring a puppet so we can just add to the joy and the fun. It's the first weekend of spring, and I anticipate we'll have a lovely time of gathering and enjoying one another's company and the company of our friends at Common Ground. All of this and more is possible with MCC Portland because you are a part of MCC Portland. Your presence, your faithfulness, your generosity allow MCC Portland to exist and to continue. So as we prepare to worship with the giving of our financial gifts and offerings, let me remind you there are a few ways to do that while we're online. You can use the online link for an electronic donation. That link again is found in the comment section. You can also use the donate button that will appear on screen and also is on our Facebook page. Both work beautifully and you can make through the donate button a recurring offering through that means. You can also mail your offering directly to our physical address, 2828 Southeast Stevens Street. You can have your offering automated to be mailed from your financial institution as I do. 
You can also use your mobile device at this moment and you can text your offering to give. That information is found here on the screen. So please pray with me as we worship with the giving of our financial gifts and offerings. God, we are grateful for all that you have done for us in the past, what you are doing for and with us in this moment, and in faith, how you will continue to be present and work with us in the future. God, from that spirit of faith and gratitude, we offer these our gifts. We pray now for those financial offerings and gifts that have already been given, those who are, that are being given in this moment, and for those who are preparing to give in the future, that all of these gifts and offerings might be blessed and multiplied, not only to strengthen our community, but so that our community can bless and strengthen others. In your holy name, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Some things are worth the fight I won't walk away I won't walk away this time Your majesty was plain as day But you choose the small and weak So I can say that my joy In the military, there's a saying you hear often. It's not yours to wonder why. It's simply yours to do or die. In today's lesson, we spoke of Christ's coming to the cross, Christ's crucifixion and resurrection being a thing of curiosity, a thing that causes people to wonder, to question. I sometimes question why that had to happen, why God planned it that way. But it's not for me to know or to question, simply to accept that God loved us so much that Christ was so willing at, 
through such agony, still willing to go to the cross, to make a way for us to come out of sin. And so we gather every time we gather at this table. We remember Christ, the sacrifice, the love, the pain and suffering, the joy at resurrection. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you once again for all you do for us, for the morning light, for the resurrection, <clears throat> for the coming of a new day, a new time, a new way. We ask that you bless these elements here and in each of our homes that we may remember as we nourish our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Here at MCC Portland, as at all MCCs around the world, <clears throat> you don't need to be a member of this congregation. You don't need to be a member of this fellowship or any church. The table is laid. The invitation is given by Christ, not by us. To come, take the bread as Jesus did. He blessed it and passed it to his friends and told them to eat of it. And when they did so, to remember this represents his body, which would be broken for them. And the cup, he blessed it and he passed it and he asked them to drink of it and remember that it represents the blood, the new covenant of life everlasting. As you think on these things, take and eat of the bread you have before you. Take and drink of the cup you have before you. And may you be blessed today and this week and in all the days to come. Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting.
Before we share our final words of blessing and part from one another, a few quick reminders. We do remain online after our closing blessing for several minutes. It's an opportunity to have conversation in the comment section, just check in and continue to build and strengthen those bonds with one another. Also, get your RSVP in for Saturday Drive-In Social, Saturday the 20th. Send your RSVP directly to admin at mccportland.com and let us know how many vehicles or how many persons will be in your vehicle. We need to have that RSVP by March 17th. Also, if you have found this time of worship a blessing to your spirit, please like and share this video with someone that you think will be blessed by a connection with us. Beloved friends, sisters, and brothers, let us recall, we have not just watched church, we are the church. Beloved, please stay safe, stay well, stay in touch, go in peace. Some things are worth the fight I won't walk away, I won't walk away this time, your majesty was plain as day, but you choose the small and weak, so I can say that my joy.
Thank you.